So, uh, a very warm welcome to everyone who's attending this evening, whether you're a member or a supporter of Christian's Engineers in Development, CED for short. Uh, or you may have no, no connection with CED and heard about us through uh, this or some other channel. Whatever the case, you're very welcome. My name is Angus Armstrong, and I'm on the executive committee of the CED, um, and I get involved in publicity matters and these tech talks. Uh, this is the first of this season, and we have a series of tech talks running through into April. Uh, the details of that are available in the newsletter um, on the website, and there are also uh, postings will go up on Facebook um, in, in the run up to, to these events. Uh, we also hope to have it our um, email reminder coming out and also get it into our, our prayer points publication. Uh, so the purpose of the talks is twofold. First, we want to increase our own level of understanding about development technology. And secondly, we want to share that knowledge with, with others um, uh, working in, in our field. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dick. Uh, Dick Waller, who you can probably see on your screen there. Dick joined CED soon, very soon after it was, it was created and has taken an interest and supported it through his working life until his retirement. But with retirement, uh, he was able to um, put more time into it um, and use his experience in the water industry at home and abroad to, uh, to, to help out on, on CED projects on the ground. Uh, and, and it's, it's lo there's a lovely little article in the end of the newsletter um, in, in this, this month's edition where Dick talks about his time in CED and his time spent with his wife, Chloe, who's been uh, um, supportive and travelled with him uh, to some of the events. So that, that's, that's super. Um, so the, su the subject I've given Dick tonight is to uh, compare and contrast water supply systems in and for the developing world. Um, so um, I've, I've had a sneak preview to some of it and I've, I've found it quite engaging. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of it. So thanks very much, Dick, and to everyone who's participating tonight. Um, if you are not a member or supporter and would like to be sent a link to, to tonight's video or, or a link to um, explore more about membership, then uh, put something in, in the, uh, the chat column I mentioned earlier on and I can... Uh, um, send you further details. And of course, this is our first tech talk. So keep your eyes open. Um, they are every, every month on a Thursday night, seven o'clock, round about this point in the month. So next one is 16th December, 20th January, 17th February, and so on. So um, what we're going to do now is hand over to Dick. Dick's going to take control and um, I think share his screen. So uh, sit back and enjoy the ride. Um, anyway, thank you, Angus, for that introduction, and good evening to everybody watching. Thank you for joining in. I've planned this as rather a, as for a general audience, and I'll try to bear in mind as we go along that some of you will, be, will not be water engineers and may not be engineers at all. I'll try and keep the technical side as straightforward as possible, and you certainly won't have to tangle with any complex mathematics. Some of the slides come from rather elderly colour prints, which perhaps reflect my age, but make points that I think important. Please forgive me for some lack of quality. Another thing which reflects my age is that my grandchildren would have assembled this lot in half the time it took me and would probably be sitting here now doing this job much better than I'm doing it. So please just forgive the dinosaur and we'll move on from there. Um, Angus has kindly helped me get to grips with an audience made up of face, faces a few feet away instead of real people in a real room and I'll try and remember that I haven't got a blackboard behind me. I hope the result will be all right. In order to minimize the risk of losing the plot, I'm planning to run straight through from beginning to end and then deal with questions. Please put questions and comments into the chat as suggested and as you, as you feel led, and when that time comes, wave at the screen if you want to make a point. Uh, no engineer knows everything, and nor do I. Despite Angus's uh, 
rather elevated description of me, my ignorance is often very evident. And uh, some of you will know more than I do, perhaps, about some of the things we're talking about. If that's the case, please feed information into the chat or raise it later on. The expression tech talk, which uh, means that we want you to talk as well as me. So moving on to the first of the slides. Yeah, all right, I'm going to talk now. Um, this diagram of the water cycle is one of many which circulate around. This one is quite useful because it shows the earth with the topography and the vegetation and the water moving through its various phases. But that's all there is. Uh, things became more complicated when animals entered the scene. And then, of course, mankind. And what mankind has done is to start moving water around in much greater quantities and often in quite concentrated areas. So we have pollution and all the other problems that come with water supply. This uh, is a picture which is one of two or three illustrating the general problem. Uh, this is up in northern Uganda, where if I use my little pointer, you can see the jerry cans waiting by the well. And they're waiting there because the well has run dry. The water table has sunk for all sorts of reasons. And people now have to wait until water can be made available. Here we have a boy who's got a bicycle, which makes his job of collecting water a bit easier, but not everybody has bicycles. But this reminds us that a cubic meter of water weighs a ton. It takes a lot of moving around. And this is another of the problems that people like me are trying to assist with. And this third one is a young boy with a donkey in Pakistan with two water containers that he's got to carry somewhere. And these pictures really crystallize the essence of it. Water has to be found. When found, it has to be developed. And when developed, it has to be moved. And at the end of all that, it needs to be in a condition in which it's clean enough for its purpose, especially if it's going to be used as potable water. And it has to be kept clean. And all these factors influence the way we design a water scheme. I'm going to now show you some pictures of a, um, oh, sorry, I'm going to show you a list of sources that are usually included. Most sources are one of these. Condensation applies only in very high mountain ranges where people can condense water out of clouds. So we'll ignore that. Uh, desalination at the bottom is not something CED has dealt with in the past. It is part of my experience, but by and large, we don't get involved in desalination. But the ones in between are of more interest to us in, in this context. A rock catchment is a place where the impervious rock outcrops and slopes in such a way that you can form a little barrier and accumulate water in it. A roof catchment is what it says. You're collecting rain off the roof of your own building or somebody else's. Spring capping is enclosing a spring so that it's not contaminated by the people trying to use it. And a wadi bed uh, is often completely dry, but floods come down it, sometimes very considerable floods, and sometimes they can be diverted. Uh, a watercourse is anything from a large river down to a little brook, and you can take water from it usually by diverting it through an intake and letting it flow on. Sometimes you have to pump it out. A borehole or drill hole, depending on what you want to call it, is usually a penetration of the ground vertically down to the point at which you've hit the water table and you then continue further down so you've got room to get a pump in. If you're very lucky, a borehole may be artesian, but there are very, very few. Now, this next group of pictures is from a place called Bubisa in northeastern Kenya. It's um, a place which is very, very dry. The landscape is harsh with high temperatures, much wind and dust. 
The ground is hard and rocky, supporting little vegetation beside the occasional thorn bush. It looks and is very forbidding and dry. This dry wadi bed outside the town was adopted as a water source, relying on the occasional flash floods which follow any heavy rainfall. Now, there is groundwater in Bubisa and there are some boreholes explo exploiting it. The problem is it's very brackish. So if people can get at this flood water and trap it, they've got fresh water at least for a time. And it's very much appreciated if you've got a very simple rural lifestyle and you are making your living out of herding goats as these people do. The floods carry large rocks down the bed which have damaged the intake structure, which I'll describe in a moment, uh, but you can see it behind the man who's standing in the middle. Um, this has never been a CD project, but Eddie Thomas and I were once asked if by another NGO for advice on how best to reconstruct and improve the intake arrangement. The outcome is unknown to me, but if Eddie's listening now or later, he may be able to add something. Uh, this next slide is the view looking downstream, and you can see here the walls between which some of the approaching flash flood is channeled, and it goes into that right angle bend at the end, and then off downhill to a place where it is stored. And the storage is underneath this roof. It's a tank which is, which is nearly all buried, but kept under this roof to keep the dust and everything else out, though that does seem to need some attention. And inside, it's like this, and you can see that all sorts of silt and clay and sand have got in here and really made it a very bad environment. Water fetched out of here would not be very potable at all. So over time, not only have they lost capacity due to all the solids coming in, but the effect on water quality has been dire, and much work would be needed to restore its usefulness. I included that little rock of pictures just to show you a fairly extreme case of a water supply problem just to whet the appetite, I hope, for things that will follow. Uh, moving on from there, um, this is a little hole in a riverbed which is dry at first sight but does in fact have water not too far under it. And I've so often seen people, especially children, trying to collect water from a place like this. As the hole gets deeper, the risk of a collapse gets greater. That's one factor. The other factor is that uh, often these are in places where animals can be dangerous. And the picture, unfortunately, doesn't do full justice to the barricade of thornbush, which has been put round. So this is another very uncomfortable environment for somebody. Um, if we move on a bit, uh, this diagram is hoping to explain what you can do, sometimes do if you have groundwater in a sandy structure with an aquifer underneath, it, which doesn't allow water to pass through. It's much less, much less transmissible than in the sand. And if I keep your attention on the top diagram to begin with. Here there is possibly, if you're lucky, a natural barrier in the form of a dike, which is rock that obtrudes through the surface up to ground level, and behind which groundwater will congregate in the sandy stratum because it can't flow on. If you're not lucky enough to have that, you would need to dig a channel across the, um, the riverbed and then put in some sort of barrier which is compacted and made into an engineering structure with some sort of impervious material on the front, maybe a plastic sheet or maybe some clay. Having done that, you could then abstract water through a well. An alternative to that, especially where the sand is not very thick, is to take away some of the overburden over the aquitude and build a similar barrier that leave space behind it for water to accumulate because water will be much more readily abstracted from impounding an impoundment like this than from a borehole. And this way you can use gravity to take the water through to a tank or other structure and possibly a livestock trench if that's appropriate. 
This is called a charco here, partly because that's the name CED is given such things, and partly because it's a name I recognize very well. It's often used in South America. But some people call them sand dams, and that's also a term that's in the literature. Now, moving on from that, before we go to the um, more common sources, I want to just go through a few principles which are important to any sort of water project. First of all, very often there is somebody around who's already dealing with the same problem, a local water engineer perhaps, or somebody who has authority. And sometimes that authority is quite severe in the sense that you do need to comply with it. So it's a good idea to research whether there is such a person and have a good talk for him. Uh, also, he may be a way of discovering the earlier relevant surveys and borehole records if there are such things. And if he's not, he may know who else is. Um, you need to check the condition of any pre-existing work and learn from it what has worked well and what has not in the local context. Calculating water demand is an important step, of course. And it is important here to include any crops or animals which are part of the livelihood of the people who are going to use the water. Uh, it's a big mistake to just count the people. Uh, it's very important to go for look after everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, then you need to look at sources of materials and manufactured goods and see how much can be obtained locally instead of incurring all the import problems. Uh, there are possibly local regulations and especially water quality standards. Having said that, some of those standards are quite unattainable in the context in which you may be working. And some of them are far less rigorous than in this country. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, you need to have some sort of sanitation and health and hygiene education in the project unless that has already been done and people are already using water wisely. And if it isn't in the project, it doesn't have to be in a CED project, but it may be part of parallel work by somebody else. An important point, access is needed for construction and maintenance. I've seen so many chambers for valves in which nobody can get in to remove the valve if that's necessary. Uh, you need to give attention to operation and maintenance. And that's another thing that is um, often overlooked. You need to keep safety in mind, not just for yourself, but for all the other people using it when we've gone away. And finally, this one I love, you remember crowd pity can always be relied upon. There's nothing else an engineer does that's guaranteed to work all the time, but gravity does. Sometimes it's not in your favor, and this is where safety comes in. Now we move on to the next one. I'm going to look at some local um, factors that might be relevant to the scheme here. For example, this is in Uganda again. We've got this channel running through closely packed huts. The huts are so close that there's a fire hazard, which isn't a water supply problem, but I still see it as a problem. But also you've got this runoff, and at busy times, this flows with human sewage. It's obviously bad for the children. It's certainly bad for anybody who falls in it. And it provides a home for vectors which will carry disease and sit on any food that's uncovered and that sort of thing. So this is why I'm talking about health and hygiene education, to make sure that somebody's looking at that kind of thing. Um, this next one shows a tap stand, which is in a very poor state. You can see the structure was founded in such a way that it would be continuous with the adjacent ground. But that's all fallen away. And the trough here that was meant to lead waste away from it isn't doing so because the levels have changed and not all the waste flows out. And around it, you've got this pool of water, which may have been clean when it came out of the tap, but certainly isn't clean by the time it's been sitting there for a bit. And the whole thing is just asking to have as much opportunity as possible to transmit disease. So you do need to bear in mind that after CD has gone away, there will be maintenance to be done. There does need to be somebody who can and will do it. Finally, some more detail of water demands. Um, 
domestic demand can be computed by looking at how many people there are, what they do with water, and uh, planning accordingly, and also allowing for future growth. Livestock, I've already mentioned. Uh, agriculture, quite a lot of people uh, use water for agriculture, which has come out of a supply which was designed for, the, for consumption only. Um, there needs to be a plan which will make sure that agriculture is provided for without depriving people. Uh, and there are commercial and industrial uses sometimes if you're in a small town or somewhere like that. So you've got markets and the common toilets that go with them, and those usually do require a lot of education on health and hygiene, believe me. You've got offices, perhaps, people running small shops and cafes. Uh, ve vehicles in repair shops and bus garages are often washed in the most careless fashion, but maybe that's a good use for water, depending on what the vehicles are for. And then there are the institutions like schools and colleges, government buildings, clinics especially, possibly places of worship. If there are several mosques, there will be a lot of demand for water at the different times of day. Uh, other factors perhaps are other users of the same water source who should preferably not be deprived just because we're helping somebody else. There could be a growth of population and sometimes that's quite fast or of the activities they undertake. Uh, there needs to be some sort of management of the system and some way of paying for the cost of producing the water. And that is a factor in the demand. So it's a bit of a circular argument, really. No water, no money, no money, no water. You need to do the economic calculation as well. And then there were several cultural factors. Some people have very definite ideas of when to use water and how much. Finally, of course, the peaks in demand sometimes. And you may feel you know the overall average demand. But if, for example, as is common, a lot of people need water in the morning for cleaning themselves and making breakfast, and in the evening for similar purposes, but not much in between, then there will be two pronounced peaks. And some of the pipes or other things conveying water may need to carry it at five or six times the average rate. Um, that's important to know before you lay all the pipelines. Uh, next diagram. This is uh, a dike. When I was talking of a dike earlier, a rock up thrust, uh, this one is a long, thin structure. You can see the ridge going along here. And both sides of it, you've got the ordinary uh, Murrum ground. But the structure itself is a natural body of rock. And here you can get an idea of what is involved in development in terms of making cities bigger, or in this case, building a new university. Often people don't realize when they see the construction work going on, how many ordinary people are making livelihoods out of hacking at the rock, giving it shape or crushing it. And there's another picture here which illustrates the same thing. Here you can see better along the ridge, and you can see the massive size of some of these rocks, and fortunately, they're bedded in such a way they're quite easy to leave them apart. But there are lots of children up here all day long crushing rock. And that, I don't think, is very good for them. But it's something that needs to be recognized. If you design concrete into a structure, ask yourself where the aggregates are going to come from. Um, now, where have we got to? Yeah, that's a local skill that you might find is available. Uh, some people make bricks out of clay and dry them, or in this case, prepare to fire them. That's a local skill that might be useful. Other local skills that might be around include this. It's not the two ladies, it's the roof behind them. Roofs like this would be very difficult for you or I to make. But in some countries, people are making this kind of roof all the time. It's quite a work of art inside, very impressive. And if you go forward one more slide, you can see here, this is the frame for the roof on another curved hut. And the whole frame will be assembled on the ground. And this is the point at which the men come in, because you need the men to lift it up and pop it on top of the structure. 
After that, the women can go back to the job and start thatching it. So um, that's a skill which people have. And if you look around at the beginning of a project, you often find skills which suggest that people are able to learn something else. And uh, I, I find this always very educational to see just how much people can do who are supposed to be uneducated and fairly helpless. They're by no means uneducated and by no means helpless. Um, if we go on from there, we'll talk about roof catchments. And here is an example. This happens to be at a school. But you can see here the roof is a metal one, very common. And there is a metal gutter coming along the side, feeding into that tank, except that it doesn't. You'll see the gutter stops. And that is because this is right up in the far north of Uganda in what was a war zone for 20 years or more. And the tank actually is full of holes if you go close and look at it. But it illustrates that you can do this. It also illustrates the vulnerability. Every roof system is at risk of being blown away in the wind, if not of damage by some other means. And this is something Ian Rankin knows a lot about. Thank you, Ian, for the photos. These are jars, as we call them in the trade, for collecting water from the roofs of individual houses. And they can be used for structures like that church behind. Wherever there's a roof, there's possibly a water source. And here, the metal straps you can see have been built, bent into shapes, which are consistent. So once you've got the pattern, you've got it. And then they're tied into a circular hoop at the top and another hoop at the bottom. And there's a concrete pad down here. And I think the next picture is, no, this is probably all right. Uh, here you can see the feet are propped against uh, the, the feet are in the ground, and there are poles here holding up the collar. So there are four of these poles, and they're set against the feet on the ground, so it is all stable. And the people are busy putting thinner wires around circumferentially. And when they've done that, they can apply some fabric like this, and then they can start mortaring it. And they go all the way up, like the, up to the top, layer by layer, mortaring this uh, framework. And eventually it looks like this. And then you can take these poles out of the inside once the mortar's gone off. And then you can get on with finishing the inside. Uh, I notice Ian's attending, he may want to say more about these. Going on from there, um, I want to talk about springs and rivers as sources. Now, this is a spring which has had very little attention. It's just wearing away as people walk down. The spring works its way back into the hillside because there's more and more erosion with the traffic. And the water is simply pouring out through this little pipe that somebody's thrust into the bank. There's not much room to catch it in a vessel of any size. And if it gets into this pond, it's immediately contaminated. And whoever comes down to get it will be puddling up the mud all around here. So it's a pretty poor situation. But you can improve on that. Here is one which has been capped so that the water now comes out of a pipe set in a concrete wall, or I think a blockwork wall that's been mortared. And you've got a little structure with steps in it, down which children especially can safely go with a jerry can fill it at the bottom and then come back up. The only comment I'd make about this one is that the water is now quite close to the spring and uh, something has gone wrong with whatever meant, is meant to be leading the water that's not taken away from the structure. There should be dry ground in the bottom, uh, dry concrete in the bottom there. Um, no, excuse me a minute, I need the next piece of paper. So that's, a, I think, a much better spring. Uh, another way of improving a spring is to build a spring box. And you can see here that you need to cut the face back of whatever the aquifer is in which the spring water is running. And you also need to find an aquatlude below if you can. 
and then turn this into a sort of dam. It's rather like the sand dams I was talking about earlier. Uh, this little box can be made of brickwork, of stone masonry, concrete, whatever's available. And it has little holes at the beginning through which the water can come from the aquifer into this enclosure and reach a natural water level. And it's worthwhile taking a lot of care to make sure that this barrier here uh, is waterproof at the top so that contamination doesn't get down from the backfield ground. Uh, there's a bit of a fall on the bottom so that if you need to empty it you can and clean it out and there's room to get in to clean it out. You need an air vent to allow the water to move up and down without problems and overflow to make sure it doesn't overfill. And then here a valve, uh, sorry, um, a, a valve offtake with a removable screen on it. And that's another reason for needing to be able to get inside. Once the water's in a pipe leading outside, you can take it to a trough or to a little um, distribution point or collection point or whatever. That's quite a common sort of structure. I've deliberately avoided dimensioning it because it depends on what you find. Um, there are many variations of this scratch design. This is the one I like, but there are many others. This is another example of a source from a, a watercourse. Um, I've got a personal interest in this one because this is the River Tamey flowing through the town of Arusha in northern Tanzania. I spent nine years of my childhood there. And when I was living there in those days, this was a beautiful little stream with nice countryside all around it. Uh, there were houses each side, but it, it was just a lovely piece of nature, like a nice park in the middle of an English town. And there were huge rocks everywhere, but the water flowed between them, made a merry gurgling sound and everybody enjoyed it. Now, as you can see, a lot of the big rocks have disappeared because people are mining them. They want to make concrete. And people are washing vehicles in this river. You couldn't have driven a vehicle into there when I was young, but somehow somebody's found a way to do it. And uh, the whole place just looks much more miserable. It's really quite disappointing. And incidentally, the big rocks I was talking about are still there under the ground and attempts to supply Arusha through boreholes when the river flow has not been sufficient have often failed because the casing of the borehole as it goes down intersects or rubs up against these rocks and sometimes the hole gets twisted by the presence of a big boulder or maybe later on a boulder moves because the fine material around it is all single sized so it's like a big boulder on a sandy beach it just moves around and it destroys boreholes and traps pumps in them so it's quite a tricky place but as a water source as you can see now um, I wouldn't want to trust it. Uh, this is a job that CD have undertaken building a um, structure to abstract water from a river in uh, I think this one's in Uganda, but I'm not quite sure. It wasn't my job. It was uh, one of John Holloway's. Uh, somebody else may know. Now, here you can see that the river is very rocky. You can see all the rocks here. And this is one of the problems that getting to these places involves being a little bit of a rock climber. When you've got there, working in them, um, Putting up some structure that will do its job is quite tricky. Making sure it's properly founded on rock and not on gaps in between, for example. And then this is the intake structure, which will eventually carry water off down to where it's wanted. And you can see the amount of protection in this next slide that has had to be put round the pipe carrying the water. And here again are the rocks. You can see how how clean they are, how big the floods are that go through here. Um, so that's, uh, sorry. That's the, in an intake. Um, I want to move on now to looking at deeper groundwater. Um, you can build a well, a hand dug well, as we call it, to reach groundwater. 
And I've shown three possibilities here. In each case, once again, we've got an acreclude, which we may not need to reach. You may have an adequate well if the water table is high enough without going that far. But I've assumed in this case that we always need to get down there. In this case, the ground stands up by itself and it's not difficult to dig down. Later on, you'll need some sort of barrier here to stop people falling in as they try to fill their buckets. But you can probably get down to the aquifer, And of course, at some point you're in water. And this is when it gets dangerous because the water permeates the soil around. And you may find that suddenly the cohesion vanishes and you get a slip. So I'm always very nervous when I see people working in sandy soil without support. In this case, the need for support has been recognized earlier on, and they've dug down a little way, put in a ring of masonry, and then put another on top of it, and then gone down a bit more around the circumference, taking out the sand and plugging it successively with, with uh, masonry stones, so that you build a ring, and then you take out a bit more soil and build another one and to go on down like this. And meanwhile, you build up the top so that it's at a height at which it's safe to use. And eventually, again, you hit the aquitude. But this stands some chance of standing up because it's all depending on the arch principle. And provided the circle is indeed a circle and the jobs have been done properly, it should be perfectly safe. In this third case, um, you can make some rings, precast concrete rings, and in each one you put a little step iron. So you dig a little way, put in the first one, put the next one on top of it, and that should be enough weight to help it to begin to sink as you take out the soil from underneath the bottom one. And it helps to have given the bottom one a cutting ring, a steel ring which will cut into the ground better than the concrete. Um, you pile up more on the top and at the same time dig away underneath as you did for the masonry and the whole lot should slide gently down under its own weight and eventually form a well. So these are all examples of a hand dug well. There are many variations. Um, often you find when you get to the rock you need to go further because there isn't really very much water and in that case there will be a need for cutting tools or something else. Um, one memory I shall never lose is of being in northeastern Ethiopia once overlooking Sudan on a very high ridge. And there were sounds of people chipping away at the rock at the bottom of a well nearby. And as we stood there and talked about our project, suddenly three men came, out, came up out of this well, all chained together and under the command of some guard. Um, these were the local prisoners who were spending their time in Jug digging a well uh, in very dangerous conditions. I'm afraid that this is the sort of spectacle that one has to be prepared for. Um, so that's hand dug wells. Now, sometimes you can't dig by hand or you don't want to because it's going to be too deep. Uh, so you get something like this, and this is just one of many patterns of truck on which you can mount a drilling rig. I use the expression drilling rig, but there is a difference between a drill hole, which is rotary drilling into whatever the formation is, and percussion boring, which is hammering into it. Uh, if we consider percussion boring first, a cutter or a chisel as it's called, is lifted and dropped into the hole repeatedly until there's enough loose material in the bottom to warrant putting down a device which will scoop up the loose material, take it away so it can be tipped out beside the hole and then you go back to cutting. And such a hole sometimes stands unsupported, but more usually it needs casing, which is steel pipe or iron pipe in short lengths which are dropped in bit by bit. Um, this is a very tall rig so it can probably handle a casing length of six meters um, and once you've got your casing down to ground level as the hole is forced on down 
you can then put another six meter length on top and then hammer that in. You just keep hammering the casing in as the hole is bored down. If it's a drill hole, then probably the ground is very rocky. Drilling in sand is not usually very successful and percussion boring in rock is not usually very successful. So there's usually a definite choice dictated, dictated by the geology between the two. And a drill hole will often come with its own casing. The casing itself may have teeth on it and you can rotate it or it may have a cutter at the bottom and you rotate this cutter very often diamond tipped to drive the hole through the rock. And in this way, using the right rig and the right tools, you can form a hole which will be often of much less diameter than a hand dug well, but is big enough to hold the pump that's going to be required to bring the water out. And I'll give you an example here of a borehole which um, I once investigated. Um, here, the term regolith is used, it's a geolog geological term for the whatever's above the rock. Uh, we think this is probably where the rock started because that's where the casing finished. And we've gone on down with various people reporting to us, oh, this well was so and so many meters deep. Uh, there are records which suggest it was this depth and that depth. And we really just did not know how deep it was. So we thought, well, let's investigate it. And here we found it had been blocked. And I think people have just been dropping holes, uh, dropping bricks down a disused borehole for amusement. Fortunately, the blockage was at this depth of 34 meters. And the water level is generally in this range up here. So we had something like 20 meters of water or more in which we could site a pump. And in the end, we did go on to redevelop this hole and put a pump into it. Before we could do that, we had to test it. And every borehole is preferably tested. Sometimes it's not possible, but it's best if you can possibly do it to get a motor driven pump on the site and pump it at given rates and see how it responds. And this is a typical submersible pump. You can have an electric cable in, uh, um, coming down to drive it and it can hang on the end of a what we call a rising main which is usually these days a plastic tube taken out of the flange at the top up to the surface. And this is the testing. So a pump like the one you've just seen is on the end of this plastic tube up which the water's been pumped. These things are what we call dip meters and there are two of them. They're used simply to know how deep the water is. And there's a tape attached to a drum. On the end of the tape, preferably at a reading which says zero, but sometimes it's some other reading because somebody has broken it. So you have to check that first. Uh, preferably at that point, there is a little device which squeaks when it hits water. It's just a simple completion of a DC electric circuit. So the gentleman here in the blue overalls is lowering the dip meter and keeping up with the water surface. And he's got a clock as well, which you can't see here, but I think it's this man. Somebody's got a clock. There must be somebody with a clock. So that as the water goes down, you can plot the level it's reached against time. And as I say, there are two of these because it's not uncommon for one to break just at the critical moment and the electrode disappears down the hole and you're stuck. So I, I very much believe in having two of them. And the next picture shows that at the other end of the job, there's somebody measuring how long it takes to fill this bucket. Of course, there are other ways of doing of measuring flow but you do need to measure the flow at the same time as you keep track of the progress of the water level. And the reason for it all is here. Um, I don't know how many of you are used to reading this kind of diagram. This is a log linear diagram. Down here, we've got the depth 
10 meters below ground, 12 and so on. And along here, we've got time in minutes and I've also put the hours in as well. And you'll notice this is a logarithmic scale. Every time you go along the same distance, you go up a power of 10. This is a linear scale. So the distance is directly proportional to distance down the hole. And it's done this way because if you do it the other way with linear scales in both directions, the curve just goes on out to the right to, to infinity. You might be pumping this well for 72 hours and it can take a very long time. And the curves are almost flat because you can't see more than a bit of it at any one time. So it's much better to use this log linear system. And here, testing has gone in three phases, which is unusual. The first phase is a test done by somebody who is commissioned by our partner organization without asking me. And they got the wrong rig in. They couldn't pump much water through it. But they got just enough information to give us an idea at what rate to start a proper test. So when we came to the proper test, it was a stage, a stage test, which means we attempted to pump at a rate which would lower water fairly slowly, but fast enough to give an idea of how transmissible water was through the rock fissures which were feeding the borehole. And having done that, we doubled the speed, the pumping rate. Um, of course, it doesn't look like that because it, the line's going all over the place. And that's because the permeability of the ground around the borehole varies a lot radially, as well as varying a lot in terms of whether you're looking north or south. So pockets of water here and there suddenly enter the game and then disappear. So you get this funny curve, but essentially it's broadly going down here in something like a straight line until we've reached this point at which we were able to say, right, we now know we can pump this hole faster. I mean, made an intelligent guess, which is sometimes what it is, and pumped at this other higher rate and got the level down to here. And this was 20 meters down below the ground and it had started somewhere less than 10. Notice it says one here. So the zero is back off in infinity as it is on a log diagram. But we had started wherever and got to this point. Now here we turned off the pump, but we kept recording water depth against time. So this is the recovery curve. And the recovery curve tells you a great deal because instead of the pump going around churning everything up, you've just got a very nice placid situation in which the water's coming back into the borehole at its own speed, driven by the local hydrogeology. And you can get information from that that you can't get from the pumping down. So having done that, we thought, right, now we know that this speed is too high, that one is probably too low, and we need to finish up somewhere this side is 30 meters down, but certainly well the other side of 20, when the borehole has been operating for some time. So we ran a 72 hour test and managed to have made a reasonable guesstimate of the right speed, because it did in fact come down here to 27 meters, after 72 hours. And that meant, if you remember, we had this obstruction in the borehole at 34. It meant we had six meters in which to place the pump if we were going to install a permanent one. So this was all looking quite good. And once again, we had a recovery. And this curve going up here took just as long as this curve all the way down here. <laughs> this was the effect of doing things logarithmically. The bigger numbers piled up against each other. But if I haven't made that too complicated, then we have here a typical fairly successful pumping test. Another thing you can do is to see what happens, or how much change there is in level per logarithmic step from 10 to 100, from 100 to 1000 and so on. And I won't bore you with the calculation, but these numbers give you transmissibility which give you an idea of how fast the water is moving under the influence of the pump through the borehole. While all this is going on, 
If there are other boreholes already in use nearby, you need to monitor them and preferably get them switched off so that you can monitor them. And if there are some local springs flowing, you may find that you can watch the flows in those and you can get an idea of how much this test is influencing the local geology and whether it's damaging somebody else's water supply. I probably shouldn't say too much more about that because time is moving on. So we'll have a look now at uh, ways of moving the water, pipelines and pumping. Um, there are different kinds of pipe. These are the common ones, plain mild steel, galvanized mild steel or ductile iron. And there were non-metallic ones as well. Non-metallic has some advantages and disadvantages. Likewise iron, uh, likewise metal. And the choice has to be made according to the situation you find, how vulnerable the pipes are, how much they might be under stress from traffic loads and so on. And also, of course, there are different joints for these things. Uh, a push fit joint like this with a rubber ring in it is very common. You can have threaded joints, especially with small diameter galvanized iron pipes. This is one for the plastic pipes. You can push them up against a hot plate pull the ends back a bit and then ram them together and hold them. And you are at risk of getting a little bump inside which reduces the flow, but you should find that the plastic all welds together and you've got a watertight joint. Joints can also be welded, but this is not usually the sort of thing we need to do on CED work. And you can have flange joints, which are common because this is how you sometimes put things like valves into the pipeline. So this circle here, is the pitch circle on which you drill a number of holes of a certain diameter. And the number of holes and the size of the bolts will between them determine the class of the flange. In other words, how much pressure it can stand. We go on from there. Uh, this is just a bit of a fright. Now this is what can happen if you don't look after corrosion. Uh, you can see here, this is totally rotted outside and it's even worse inside. Now, I've personally not seen many of those in the sort of situation in which CD works, but I have worked a lot in Arabia and I've seen a lot of pipes like this, which are pretty frightening. Uh, this is a plastic pipe, which in this diameter, which is about 90 millimeters, can be coiled, you know, 25 meters in each of these coils. And this makes it very light to Small, very easy to handle, but there's a big warning here. When these tapes are cut, the thing will try to get itself straight as fast as it can, and you can kill people by opening the by cutting the tapes carelessly. You really have got to make a very careful assessment who, who's around and make sure it's tied down. Uh, what is next? Now, a little bit of hydraulics. Um, imagine that this is a cylinder full of water of a certain height H, and it's got unit area at the base. So if we talk in terms of meters, it's H meters high, it's got one square meter area at the base, therefore contains H cubic meters of water, which weigh H tons. Our part way down it, the pressure is less. The pressure is governed by this depth from the top to here and uh, not by the whole depth. So the pressures expressed in different units are along here. These are gauge pressures, tons per square meter. I say gauge because atmospheric pressure is acting all round and therefore can be discounted. And it's just the height of the column that matters. So the gauge pressure here is zero and the gauge pressure at the, pressure at the bottom is H, with H minus X in the middle, where X is the depth here at which you're measuring the pressure. You can turn that into meters of water and you get exactly the same numbers for the reason I've explained. Then you want to know what is the potential energy, and that is Z, which is the height of this base above some arbitrary datum, and here it's Z plus X and here it's Z plus H. And the total energy in this tube of water just standing here is therefore Z plus H here, that's the 
elevation plus the pressure, and it's Z plus H there because it's these two added together, and it's Z plus H there because it's these two added together. Now let's pretend that we can make this pipe very, very high, say three kilometers high, and rotate it about its base so that it leans over like this. Now H is still the height to the top of the column, but of course the top of the column would be way off the top of the diagram here. And so we are looking at a lower total pressure, whatever the pressure is here uh, at the bottom, it's governed by the level of the top of the pipe where it is now and not where it was back up here at the beginning. So we're in our mind's eyes, we're rotating this pipe and to get, until it gets closer and closer to horizontal. And when we've done that, we can choose to put some bends in it. And now we're beginning to see something like a pipeline profile, which is what happens if you pretend you can cut the ground vertically along the length of a pipeline. And here the pipeline is below ground by some level, whatever it is, and it generally will follow the contours, often in a trench, along like this. And now we can ask ourselves, what's going to happen if we push up the pressure here to get water to come out at the other end? Now, if we put the pressure up to here, we are at the same level as the outlet. So we've got the pipe full of water, but none of it's moving. If we put the pressure up further here, there's a pressure difference along the length of the pipe, which causes water to start coming out. And this is the cue to move to the next diagram, which shows that the water flowing along in this pipe uh, is subject to two influences. One is the pipe wall being rough, and we call that the rugosity. The rougher the pipe walls, the more the water by the wall is dragged back in comparison with the rest. The other influence is due to the liquid. It's the viscosity, and I'm calling this the runniness. If you imagine a tube full of treacle or something and compare it with a tube full of water, you'll know what I mean. So we have these two things, if you like, the roughness and the runniness, which are controlling how the water runs through. And there is a boundary layer here in which the rugosity, the roughness, is dominating. In the center of the pipe, up to the center line and across the other side, the viscosity is dominating. And there are charts which will tell you how much pressure loss there is per length of pipeline in all sorts of diameters and for all sorts of values of roughness and viscosity. And this is what the pipeline engineer works with. And he needs that in order to do this. Here is our pipeline, its real profile, which is the tube that's been tilted on its side as described earlier. Here we can pump at the outlet from a tank. And here we are pumping into a tank. And if these tanks look a funny shape, notice that here I've got three kilometers in that space, but here vertically, I've got about 60 meters. So it's usual to draw pipelines in this distorted way, because otherwise you have masses and masses of sheets of paper, and you just can't imagine it because you can never see it all at once. So there's usually a distortion in a pipeline profile. Now here, if I decide to install a pipe of say 150 millimeters diameter, I find I have to pump up to this level to get water to flow out the other end at the speed I want. And I've decided I want 20 liters a second and I've got 0.3 millimeters roughness. Here are elevations above the datum, which is say sea level. Here are elevations above the pump. So the pressure here is on this diagram and it's about 58 meters or 58 tons per square meter. If I put in this very thin pipe, 150 millimeters, about six inches, this is what happens. I need a pressure of nearly 60 meters head to pump the water down there. If I put in a 175 millimeter pipe, this curve climbs down quite a bit. And you can see as the diameter up, as you would expect, 
the pumping pressure required goes down. Here we have this potential energy, which I mentioned before, above the arbitrary datum. Here is the pressure energy. And here at the top, so all this is the pressure energy. Here at the top, there's the kinetic energy of the water, which is V squared over 2G, the velocity squared divided by twice gravity's acceleration. And this is called the hydraulic gradient line, or the total energy line. Um, total energy here minus total energy here is what's driving the water along this pipeline. But the pump has to generate more because it starts at a lower point. The pump is already this far below the finishing point. So the pump is lifting the water by this amount, about 20 something meters, and then it's adding this amount of pressure to get the water to flow. And this is how people design pipelines. And a final important point, if the pipe is metallic, it probably is classified by its internal diameter. If it's plastic, it's probably classified by its external diameter. And if we go back to the previous diagram, um, if we look at 150 millimeters, we might decide, oh, wait a minute, 175 will help us better. Oh, there's a standard plastic pipe, 180 millimeters diameter. Let's have that. So you put it in without realizing that it's internal diameter. It's only going to be about 150. So you get this performance having paid for that pipeline. And it's one thing to discover while you're still in the design stage that somebody's made a mistake. It's another thing to discover when you've made you've laid the pipeline it's too late to change it but you've still got time to buy a different pump but it's quite another thing to discover that it's only when you turn the thing on and all the flags are out that it won't pump as much water as you expected so do be careful of pipe nine diameters choose the right one and again if i go back here um i should mention that just as changing the diameter changes what the pump can do Accidentally changing the diameter, as I've described with a plastic pipe, means the pump characteristic and the system characteristic are not matched properly, and you've moved away from the point of maximum efficiency on the pump characteristic. On top of that, you're, you can already see on this diagram, you're going to pay about 6% more for your energy. So you either pay more for the energy or get less water out, but one way or another, you are penalized. Um, just a few little things to finish with. This is a good example of a roof catchment, but it's one I like. It's in a place in Uganda where somebody's thought, wait a minute, this could be a public benefit. So they've got the tank over here, people can come and collect their water, but you've also got this large space where people can shelter or have meetings. And with a corrugated iron roof, it may be slightly hot to have meetings, especially in the middle of the day. But if it's raining, this is a very nice place to be. And more and more villages are beginning to do this. They make, uh, they take advantage of the fact that to have a flat roof gives you not only the water, but also the shelter. And if all the dwellings are thatched, this is a very great asset. Um, this is a form, a way of storing water. As I've mentioned before, sometimes the demand for water peaks. So it's no good just storing it uh, in the pipeline. You have to put it into some sort of place where you can accumulate it when the demand is low and then let it out to supply when the demand is high. And in many, many places, pumping can't take place at night because there's too much risk either of having the pump stolen or of having the operator attacked. So you probably want a peak factor of two or three just in your main supply, and maybe a higher peak factor in the di distribution to houses or taps. It's nice to have a gauge on the side of a tank. Put one on if you can. You can see then what's in it without having to go all the way up. And this is quite nice. Somebody's actually thought of the safety of the people climbing up. So there's, there's protected access right the way to the top. Unfortunately, it doesn't extend to here, which is where the overflow comes out. 
So if you want to do with that, you've got to risk your neck a bit. And this is another kind of storage. This is a standard CVD one used in Tanzania a lot. Here, the ladder and its protection are still being installed and the rails around here have yet to be installed. But mercifully, somebody has thought about safety and that's a great thing. And I think that is the point at which I shall stop showing slides. Um, I'm just going to... Uh, Angus, can you guide me? How do I get back to the normal screen? I just Stop share, there we are. Right, um, yeah, just a few closing remarks. I've said very little about water quality because I'm hoping that that will get dealt with. Nigel Healy is talking about water treatment later, so perhaps he'll have something to say. And I haven't said much about pumps. It may have sounded as though I did, but I'm not really an expert on pumps. And I hope that whoever talks to us about pumps will cover that subject in more, more detail and perhaps more accurately than myself. Otherwise, that's it for the moment. I've got a, about six slides as a horror show if you want them, but time is passing. Maybe we should stop here for the moment and see what's in the chat. Okay, thank you very much, Dick. Thank I'm you. Really that control, shall I? Uh, well, hold on to it for now. It's, it's okay. okay. Um, uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for sharing all your experiences and insights over the years. Um, if anybody has got any questions, uh, if we can all unmute ourselves now. Um, I think I've got a way of doing this. No, I don't think I can do it. You can, if you just tick your microphone, you can unmute yourself. And uh, if you've got any questions, then um, I'm sure Dick will be very happy to try and answer them. And if you're having difficulty with that, you can put, uh, you can type it into the chat box at the side. Nigel. Uh, thanks, um, thanks, Dick, but a lot for that talk. Um, yeah, I was just my query relates actually to the borehole pumping. Um, and I just wondered if you had a situation where you've tested the yield of a borehole and but you were that was based really on continuous pumping 24 seven, shall we say, if you were having using solar pumping where you were only pumping maybe 10 hours a day or where the sun shines how would your year can you pump harder for shorter periods and then no pumping for another period so that you basically get the same sort of yield as you would if you were pumping 24 7 or are you inevitably going to get a drop in yield if you were to do that do you have any sort of thoughts on that um yes if we go back to the if you've got a mental picture of the diagram i had up there before of the pumping test curves uh we had about six or seven meters space for the pump between the lowest point reached in the 72 hour test and the obstruction further down the borehole and that would be long enough to carry almost any kind of submersible pump electrical submersible pump so um, you would be able to choose a number of different levels for the pump and the higher you choose the more likely it will run out quickly but against that, if you're going to pump all day, you've got to be in a place where it's secure to do so. And you've got to have the storage to take the water that comes up. Um, I've, I haven't got any experience of a pumping system on the CED sort of scale, whether with CED or in previous work, which pumped all night, because the probability of doing so was limited. Um, we had to bear in mind the security of the people running the pumping. Uh, we also had to bear in mind the security. One of my worries with solar power, incidentally, is always that somebody will come and pinch the panel. And maybe cheaper is not quite so important, but it does worry me quite a lot. And I think the thing to do really is to try and plan for a situation in which the storage tank is full every morning people can use it and during the day the pump mechanic will notice what the level is after breakfast and he'll start the pump up and keep it going up to the evening peak and if necessary beyond it 
but once it's dark, he's probably gone home. Uh, certainly in the sort of places I'm thinking of. Um, so you have to match your pump to the hours pumping you're going to do and to the demand pattern on the reservoir. Um, putting these things together is quite an interesting exercise, but it cannot be done without knowledge of the community and also knowledge of the technical capability of the people who are going to run the system. Um, I don't think that's a complete answer, but I hope it's enough. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I suppose more of a just a general question. Um, what what water projects are uh, CD involved with at the minute? Uh, at this moment, we have people in Tanzania who've been trained to build the um, the jars that I showed you earlier on for roof catchments, and we usually have a roof catchment project going on somewhere. There's one in Rwanda, which I believe is still live. Um, if Barbara were here, she would know better than I do, but there are projects of that sort going on all the time. And also, of course, we are training people not only to do that, but also to do it again for somebody else. And each jar serves perhaps a house or maybe two houses at the most in some cases. So the ladies who do this work, and it is usually the ladies, can then become a team who can go off and build somebody else's. So we're doing training as well as construction. Um, there is a hydroelectric scheme underway somewhere in the, I think it's in the Congo. Um, Jono would know about that, but I don't see his face up there. Um, does anybody else have any sort of closer touch, closer feel of what's going on at the moment? Yeah, we're working away in Pakistan as well, just with the focus on ending open defecation. But that, that is involving a couple of reservoirs and repairing some wells and so on and digging water tanks for household or encouraging people to dig water tanks. And in the in, in that case, uh, Ian, am I right in thinking that you're you're catching rainwater, but sort of on an apron around a buried tank more rather than catching it off a roof? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think there are a couple of um, uh, mini hydros projects going on in Uganda and, and there's also a water supply for a hospital which Nigel might like to say more about. Yeah that's for Kaganda Hospital in West Uganda <clears throat> um, and that's a supply to maybe 10,000 people um, from a river intake. Um, through some filters into a, a new storage reservoir and then supplying into the, the hospital area and also the community around. So that's underway at the moment. Um, if you go to the website of CED, you can get a good idea of what's going on. And it's much more reliable than asking me. Because, uh, although I, I'm aware generally of what's on, I don't have a sort of detailed catalogue in my head of all the live projects. Thank you. Well, if nobody else has got any other questions, and do shout if you have. <laughs> um, and I think it just, just falls to me to say thank you very much, Dick, and, and uh, for sharing everything you have. And thank you to everybody who's, who's joined us tonight. So it's, 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 it's a very encouraging to have a, a good audience. Be a bit sad if it's just the two of us. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you're able to join us on, on some of our, our future talks. Rob yeah. Brickhouse, who's uh, with us tonight. Hi, Rob. Um, is is our, our next speaker. And he, he's going to tell you a bit more about CED. And, and um, I'm looking at my chart on the wall to see what title I've given him who we are, what we do, and how we do it, um, I think was the title I gave, gave you, Rob. It won't, uh, it, won't be, it won't be very technical, Angus, but I'll do my best. <laughs> well, it's not really supposed to. It's supposed to be let people know what we are. Um, so that's great. 
Um, and that's on the 16th of December, so uh, which is a Thursday, and that'll be at seven o'clock again. So I hope I hope you're able to come and join us with that. And um, if you think there are other people out there who may be interested in uh, these sort of things, then please share the word. So uh, thank you very much again. And I think we've bade each other good night.